was, by 1821, a world traipse sea lane known as the Roaring Forties, linking England to its southern colonies, Australia and New Zealand. Well into the journey to Tasmania, the captain of the English clipper Emerald wasn't expecting anything but ocean in this stretch of the southern seas. Only, there it was, unmistakably, Captain William Elliot and the crew were peering through the mist at a small, inhospitable island jutting out of the ocean. Elliot checked his charts and position, unless his eyes were deceiving him, a rocky island with a high peak mountain. It shouldn't be there. Blinked twice, thought either, I must be wrong, or I'm off course, and double checked, and then came to the conclusion. Bingo, a find. Everyone had sailed past it and missed it, baptising their desolate rock, Emerald, after the vessel. Let mark the position on the charts. Latitude, 57, 57 degrees, degrees, 30, 30 minutes, minutes south. south. Longitude, Longitude 162, 162 degrees, degrees and 12 minutes, minutes east. east. For all us landlubbers, that's a location a thousand miles south of the nearest major inhabited landmass, New Zealand. It's closer to Antarctica. This wasn't a spot to dilly-dally and celebrate the find with a whiskey, nor risk putting anyone ashore. Elliot needed to get on his way with his cargo of settlers, supplies and convicts. This was the first sighting of Emerald, putting it literally on the map. Emerald was now a fixture. Most sailing ships opted to give the island a literal wide berth from time to time when the weather and oceans weren't the status of horrendous. Vessels on their way to and from Australia and New Zealand did plot to travel near the island close enough to theoretically eyeball it, scanned the horizon to find it empty, becoming in many quarters more, more mythical, mythical than, than real, real, was featured front and centre in Will Lawson's book, The Lady of the Heather, the fictional story of an illegitimate granddaughter of Bonnie Prince Charlie, a Jacobite princess kidnapped and abandoned on a remote island to prevent her accession be devil. The foreboding isle, where children who didn't eat their veggies were threatened to be sent to. Still haunted godless islands aside, it was a navigational reference point, one that was on the radar of the American Commodore Charles Wilkes during his South Seas surveying and exploring expedition in 1841. Wilkes' plan was for his vessel, the USS Vincennes, to rendezvous with the USS Porpoise, provision if possible, at Emerald, and then travel south to the Pole. Like other sailors gazing into the sub-Antarctic Ocean for Emerald, he came up empty-handed, putting it down to inclement weather. This cat and mouse would go on for another 70 years. Meanwhile, cartographers were still placing emerald on their maps, a practice that would not stop until just before World War II. There did however come a point when a definitive establishing its existence was seen as important. Other than being a navigational hazard, this was the era of finders keepers, pins and maps. There are a lot of countries with a desire to add more of those, not just England and her closest imperial domains, New Zealand and Australia. There was Norway, United States, Belgium, France, Germany and Russia wanting a piece of the polar action to reap any possible military or economic advantage possessing emerald. A point in case being, emerald's territorial waters were not to be sniffed at 40,000 square kilometres. And those waters were swimming Team Britain were now all worried the island would be annexed. 
the oil lights would go out up in Scotland. In 1877, a mission was sent south from Chalmers, the port for Dunedin. Captain Sol of the vessel Friendship was on a two-pronged surveying mission to claim once and for all Emerald's closest northern neighbours, Macquarie, then head south 500 miles to Emerald. Needless to say, in part one went swimmingly. Macquarie was nominally to be administered by Australia. Part two, not so. The Admiralty now scratched Emerald off the map. Don't think, though, this was the end of the story. Part of the reason why Emerald was even on the map in the first place was the overhead conditions above the island, the prevailing winds that powered the sailing ships of the day. As more and more vessels converted to other modes of propulsion, steam, fewer and fewer vessels now saw the need to travel this route. Macquarie became the southern limit of most travels. By 1890, the subject of a territorial dispute between New Zealand and Australia, as sealers from both countries fought each other, literally, for the lucrative seals that flocked to the island. By the turn of the century, there was one horrible thought in the minds of New Zealand and Australian governments. Perhaps, Perhaps previous, previous expeditions, expeditions didn't, didn't search, search properly. properly. With the dreaded Germans and Russians sniffing around, British backing, the Australians were going to find out once and for all. There were, after all, four islands marked as doubtful in 1909. Royal Company, south of Tasmania. Emerald, south of New Zealand. Then travel east on the same latitude, a further away across the Pacific Ocean. And there was Nimrod, the name of Shackleton's vessel. No relation to the one I'm about to explain here then travel even further east towards South America to Doherty Island. Final turnaround for the voyage of discovery, Montevideo, Uruguay. In May of 1909, Captain J.K. Davis departed Sydney Port on his island spotting travels. Showing his presence in the waters of Macquarie, where poaching and squatting were rife. The only thing they did find was a grateful skin and bones Irishman shipwrecked on Macquarie. No royal company. No Nimrod. No Doherty. And most importantly for our story, no Emerald. They were all now designated as Phantoms. The question now, we must ask ourselves, was there even an island in the first place? Maybe. Even in the 1890s, it was thought of as a real place by sailors in Australia and New Zealand. Dubious sightings did occur. Were they real or wishful thinking? Self-deception? Putting our feet on the ground? A couple of months after Elliot's original observations... Russian scientist camped on Macquarie detected a massive earthquake. There are other cases in Krakatoa, Indonesia, 1883, where powerful earthquakes have resulted in islands being there one day and gone the next. In the most powerful earthquake ever recorded, in Chile, 1960, a 9.4 quake that sent a huge wave all the way across the Pacific into New Zealand, resulting in evacuations on the east coast. In that, six islands off the Chilean shores vanished in 10 short minutes. Macquarie Island had an 8.1 earthquake in 2004. By comparison, Christchurch 2011 was 6.3. The way magnitude is measured, Macquarie was 60 times greater. Not beyond the bounds, Emerald sank below the waves. The Macquarie fault line does go right underneath Emerald's position. Good luck confirming that though. Rough depth in that location, 5 kilometres. Then there's the human fallibility meets Mother Nature. Fog banks. Mists. 
to the more credible drifting giant iceberg. We will never know exactly what they spotted. Emerald remains, therefore, a phantom island, like its mates, Royal Company, Nimrod and Doherty. That's all from me today, fab listeners who have got this far. My dastardly plan is to produce a high-quality podcast every 10 days. If strange and eclectic are your thing, what spins your wheels, please return, subscribe, and do whatever is necessary so that I can spot you next time. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.